back, everyone. It's middays. We're live at the University of Southern Mississippi for the Children's Advocacy Centers of Mississippi. We welcome now Representative Kent McCarty. He uh, represents District 101. That's uh, Lamar County. Serves as the Vice Chair of the House Education Committee. Representative McCarty, always good to see you. Thanks for having me. Good to see you as well. I see you've got your USM regalia That's on right. today. That's right. right. I always got to represent the uh, USM, <laughs> SMTTT, always. It's awesome. <laughs> we are glad to be here on the campus. Still not quite in session yet, right? Uh, that no, get started? yeah, we're still a few weeks away from that. Yeah. So. Of course, all the K-12, through or yeah. most of them, they They're started. back. Our um, Lamar County went back about a week ago, I guess, maybe maybe two now. We okay. start, we do the, the modified calendar okay. in Lamar County. So. I got you. In my county of Madison, we have not yet adopted that, but I do know they went back to school August 1. Yeah, it's not that much different, really. Right. I mean, we're talking about a week and a half earlier, maybe, and, and you get some extra two-week breaks here and there. I think it's a great thing, so hopefully maybe you all will be there soon. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, the uh, let's talk about the current events. We got a, a vice presidential candidate in uh, Governor Tim Waltz from Minnesota is going to be joining uh, Vice President Kamala Harris on the Democratic ticket. Well, I, w I was just talking about her, uh, the word is, at least, uh, f to the extent you can rely on that, that <laughs> she wasn't sure even last night. It would be, had been reported it was down to two. Right. Governor Walz, two governors, and Governor Josh Shapiro of the state of Pennsylvania. But that decision, uh, she says, was made, uh, at least from some reports, if you believe those, was made literally this morning before the announcement opted for uh, Governor Tim Waltz. Now, I have a theory about that I just shared, and one of those, which I think is relevant to our discussion today, is that uh, Governor Josh Shapiro of Pennsylvania is a school choice advocate, and that uh, he, he is, has been in uh, the governor's mansion of Pennsylvania when various school choice measures were enacted and I'm thinking that that's not something that's popular with Democrats. I think you're well aware of that. They, <laughs> their their uh, solution, I guess, to um, um, improving educational outcomes is to dump more money into public education but restrict a parent's choice, which is what school choice would, would uh, enable, of uh, the best education setting for their students. I'm thinking that this choice was made because of Governor Shapiro's pro school choice position that perhaps would alienate a key voting block in base of support for the democrats that being the uh, public school uh, unions in mississippi you of course along with uh, chairman rob robertson you guys had legislation this year that would have phased in universal school choice and once again we had a false start couldn't get that done are we going to try for that again i don't know um you know i think we've talked about this before yeah yeah obviously there's there's a lot of um you know big I guess issues, different facets of this that we've got to work out, you know, in Mississippi, and and really decide if that's the route we want to go. I and mean, there's a huge cost associated with it, which is obviously something we've talked about a lot. Um, you know, a, a net new cost to the budget that that would come with um, a universal choice program like that. Which, um, you know, you and I have also talked about, you know, our desire to cut taxes. So sure. you got to look at it. At the end of the day, it becomes a question of are we going to do this or that because we can't do it all. And I think that's kind of been the big block for us. I mean. Mississippi is a little bit um, in a little bit of a unique situation when you look at the number of students we have in public school compared to the number we have in private. There's a huge share of students who are already in private school. So if we were to bring a universal choice program onto the books, all those students that um, are already in private school, which we're talking 40, 50,000 kids, uh, would then be eligible for the voucher um, to you know for their private eventually. Education. Eventually, right? Yeah. So when phased in, we're talking about 40, 50,000 kids that are already in private school that would then be eligible for a voucher. Um, you know, if you say that's uh, the average per pupil allotment for the state's about seven thousand or so. You, you allocate that out. That's three hundred fifty million dollars. Um, so, so there's legitimate questions about where that money's going to come from, how that money will be, or how that would be paid for. Um, that I think, you know, we've got to take that into consideration. Obviously, uh, we don't want to break the budget for any one thing. Sure. And when we've got taxes, we're talking about cutting. I know we've talked about cutting the grocery tax. We've got tax cuts that aren't fully phased in. I think there's just a bigger question about the how. I think there's a lot of people that agree that this is something they want to do, but getting there is a little bit more difficult. Yeah. Well, uh, we did have some major, a uh, major win, I should say, this past session with uh, a rather radical change to the way we fund public schools in the state of Mississippi. Talk about that. Yeah, we had a huge, uh, huge win on that front. Um, you know, going back way before I've been in the legislature, we've talked about 
replacing the the funding formula that we had on the books prior to this year. It was called MAP, the Mississippi Adequate Education Program. Um, it had been around since the 90s. There have been attempts for years to, to do something about that. Um, I think, you know, the House really led on this issue uh, with Chairman Robertson and the Speaker's support. Obviously, we, we put together a really good, um, you know, very, you said the word radical, it's true, a radical departure of what we were doing before, yeah. really funding schools based on the student population that they're serving. And I think what we've seen with that as you know, we passed it this session, finally got an agreement with the Senate, passed it this session, went into effect for this school year. Um, and what we've seen is that a lot of the school districts, you know, exactly what we thought would happen, school districts that have you know been chronically underfunded in areas um, that just don't have the resources or have been able to do a lot already they've already announced they're putting into place that should hopefully improve outcomes in those areas and i think it'll be interesting now that we know exactly why each dollar is going where it's going we can really look and say okay is this a great use of those funds is this an efficient use of those funds and we can really see what we're getting for the money we're putting in so all in all it's a much more it's a much fairer allocation of the funds um, than we had before, but also a much more transparent way to fund, which I think is a big key part of this that we haven't really talked about quite as much. Well, uh, perhaps one of the most redeeming features of the new funding formula is that uh, people actually understand it. Right. Because <laughs> <laughs> nobody understood the prior it's, one. It's much easier to understand than the last one, for sure. That was uh, uh, one of the, the first talking points when we spoke with any superintendent was, look, if we pass this, if you know the number of students and which categories those students fall into, are they special needs, are they right. low income, you can... If you can figure out what money you're going to get from the right. state, you know, in five minutes. You have yeah. a calculator and, you know, some scratch work paper. You can figure it out in five minutes. So that's that was a huge selling point for sure. Yeah, no doubt about it. So what are your priorities uh, uh, for the next legislative session from an education perspective? I mean, the, the funding formula deal was a huge win. That's yeah. big. That's that's put to bed now out, out of the way. What are we going to work on next? Yeah, um, you know, we got, we got some good stuff done, but there's still a lot left to do. So I think uh, one of the things I'm really passionate about and have been for a long time is early childhood education. Um, we've got right now in Mississippi one of the, the best um, early childhood programs in the country. I mean, it's nationally talked about as, as far as the outcomes we get in this program. So uh, right now we're serving about 25% of the students and the four-year-olds in the state. Um, again, it's optional. It's not a requirement of any sort. Um, and, and our program is unique in that it actually works with um, – it's, it's more of a, a public-private partnership in, in a way. Um, you know, you can make tax, you, you get tax credits for donations you make to the collaborative program, which is a similar setup we have for a lot of different um, programs for, for different reasons yeah. throughout the state. But the uh, pre-K collaborative is one of the first areas we did that in, and it allows, you know, uh, individuals, uh, businesses to make contributions to their local collaborative, and they receive a dollar-for-dollar -dollar tax refund for that. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, for a, a bank, you know, I've spoken with dozens of banks in the state that have been able to donate one hundred fifty thousand um, dollars, and, and basically fully offset their state income tax uh, liability based on that the check they wrote to the collaborative. So, I would love to see us continue to grow that. Again, it's a nationally recognized organization that we are um, plan that we have, and it it is it has good outcomes. We follow those students throughout their education, and um, you know we typically see that they do better than students that come in without some kind of background going into kindergarten. So The uh, Education Enhancement Fund, which is a, a special fund <clears throat> that uh, was, was passed into law several years ago, but it's, it specifies how funds allocated to it, to that fund, are to be distributed. There's lots of formulas and percentages. Mm -hmm. The Early Learning Collaborative is one of the recipients That's right. of the funds from that. Of course, all proceeds from the Mississippi Lottery Corporation, over $80 million in a year, go to the Education Enhancement Fund. So I'm, I'm thinking, Representative McCarty, that uh, we should have more money to deal with. It's going to Early Learning Collaborative. Perhaps we ought to revisit the formulas in that EEF. Yeah, that's something that we've, um, you know, especially in the last term, this, this new term that started with this year was really... You know, as we talked about, it was pretty yeah. much consumed with the formula, the funding <laughs> formula. But in the last term, we looked, we had looked at some changes to EEF to, okay. to make sure that money was spent um, really for the purpose of why the fund was created. So I think right now it, there's a lot that goes in and out of that fund, um, and I think a lot of it's good stuff, but I think we should probably look at all the different things, the different percentages that are cut off for this and that, and, and make sure that all of those things are really serving the purpose of why it's there. Tax reform, something we talk about, as you <laughs> mentioned earlier, we are in, uh, so we've eliminated the 3% that was done in the in the prior term. We have uh, eliminated the 4%. That happened last year. We're in the first phase of uh, pulling back the 5% bracket down to 4, I think 0.3% this year, 0.3% next year, 0.4% in uh, 2026. We got a break on us right now, but... Uh, 
you know, this is something that uh, Speaker of the House Jason White and the governor are strong advocates mm -hmm. for, and that's figuring out a way to uh, fully eliminate the income tax. If you can hang around, we'll talk about that yeah, on the other side. Absolutely. Of the we got Representative Kent McCarty. We're at the University of Southern Mississippi for Children's Advocacy Centers of Mississippi. Stay tuned. We're coming right back. Mississippi, we're visiting with uh, Representative Kent McCarty. He represents nearby Lamar County. So before we went to break there, Representative McCarty, we were talking about efforts to eliminate the income tax. We, we've had uh, kind of what I describe as a down payment by uh, eliminating the 3%, the 4% bracket, and uh, now we're down to a 5% bracket that is being whittled down to 4% over the next three years. So it's, it's good that we have one single rate, honestly. All, that would be all uh, taxable income over $10,000. But this stops short, I think, of what uh, the speaker would like to see happen. The governor as well. The lieutenant governor doesn't, governor doesn't seem to be quite as keen on the idea, shall we say. <laughs> But then there's also this issue of uh, sales taxes on groceries, either reducing those or full elimination of sales tax on groceries. Uh, do you think this is going to be something we're, we're going to take up again this coming session? I really hope so. I mean, I think, you know, the House has, has continued to show our interest in it. The Speaker's put together his tax reform committee uh, that I think is a really serious, you know, they're taking a really serious look at what else we can do. For tax reform and i think there's some really interesting um you know big picture things we could do to kind of reinvent our tax structure in mississippi i mean it is very clunky and and kind of um you know i guess a little backward thinking as far as how we do it but i think you know the, to the grocery tax point there's huge support for that i mean i you know i was watching some of the neshoba speeches i didn't get to go but just watching some of the highlights and it seems like everybody pretty much has agreement that we need to cut or eliminate the grocery tax. So that's how you know it definitely is not going to happen because um, we're all on the same page about it somehow, miraculously. Um, but hopefully we could we could start with that. I mean, we're not talking about a huge amount of money to just slowly start coming down on that. Um, it's one of the highest in the country. And I think there's a real argument to be made that that's one of the best ways for us to put money back in the pockets of Mississippians um, to all Mississippians is to cut those taxes because, you know, who's who's not buying groceries. So, um, you know, I think that's a great start, and I think we need to keep making work on the income tax. I, I, I appreciate the approach we've taken so that we don't, you know, go all in. I think we've all, um, you know, it's an extreme case, but, you know, there's, I forget what state it was a few years back that, that went full into the income tax repeal and then had to end up coming back and adding taxes in later. You never Kansas. wanted to, can, was it Kansas? Mm -hmm. I can remember if it was Kansas or mm -hmm. Oklahoma. Um, but, yeah, you know, you, you don't want to be in a situation like that. Um, because adding a tax after removing it is probably the worst thing you could ever do to somebody. That's so mean to say sure. we're going to take your taxes away and then give them right back. Um, so, you know, we've got we to gotta take a measured approach to it, but I think we've done that, and I think, you know, you've seen the last, you know, really two terms we've, we've chipped away at that, um, you know, the income tax, or, or tried to at least, and, and we're still making progress on it. So I'm excited to see what comes out of this committee and, yeah. and see what comes up for, for a vote next session. Well, I, I do think that uh, uh, reducing or eliminating the sales tax on groceries, there's no doubt that uh, has a lot of uh, support in, in both chambers. Mm -hmm. The concern I have is that if we were to do that, uh, that's probably, I think, estimated three $400 million of revenue to the state. It almost ensures that it would be really difficult to eliminate the income tax, certainly in any short period of time. We'd probably have to do it over a very long period of time based on various triggers. Right. Yeah, it would definitely prolong things, and I think, you know, that's something we got to consider. Um, you know, whether we want to do full elimination or just do a reduction, uh, maybe pair a reduction in the grocery tax with a reduction, further reduction in the income tax. Um, I think those are, you know, that would be a good compromise position, I guess. But, but again, I mean, I think starting somewhere like groceries, um, you know, we've, we've done a lot of cuts to the, the income tax. We're still phasing in corporate tax cuts from before I was elected. Um, might be nice to do a little switch up and, and cut those grocery taxes a little bit and then circle back around and, and look at what we can do on the other side. But, um, you know, I think there's a lot of good options, and we're fortunately still in a, in a decent enough budget position where we can even be having these conversations, which I think is great and just a testament to, um, you know, how well things have been going in Mississippi the last few years. 
And then I think there's, of course, the issue that uh, I know you're aware of is is that it would eliminating or reducing the sales tax on grocery would uh, have a, an effect on the revenues to municipalities, many of which rely almost exclusively That's right. on sales taxes uh, levied on groceries for their revenue to operate. That's right. And that's I think that's honestly been the biggest uh, impediment to some kind of reduction in grocery taxes, the impact it would have on cities. Um, and I know there's been, <clears throat> excuse me, there's been a lot of talk with them to try to figure out how we can alleviate some of that. But, um, you know, I mean, if we're talking about, to, to your point about the cost, reducing the grocery tax and then subsidizing the reduction in tax to the cities, that's an even bigger expense yeah. on top of a reduction in income. So um, we've got to, it's, it's a balancing act. And again, we're very fortunate. There, there haven't been many times in Mississippi's history where we've been able to talk about you know, are we going to cut income taxes and grocery taxes or just one? You know, we're talking about that now. In the past, it's been, are we going to cut spending by 5% because we don't have any money to pay the bills? Or are we going to just borrow money to cover our, our you know, short-term obligations because we don't have any money to pay the bills? So we're in a fortunate spot, um, but we've got to be really careful with, you know, how we handle that and be good stewards of that. And I think that, um, you know, some combination that, that reduces the tax burden on Mississippians is, is you know, when we just got to do it in a, in a careful way. Saw that the LBO just released uh, the report for the first month of the fiscal year, that being July, and it looks like revenues came in above sine die a mm -hmm. little bit. Uh, below, however, the same period last year, which is to be expected given that we reduced the income tax. Right. But overall, Mississippi's in pretty good shape, and we, st we still produce, what, seven $800 million uh, surplus for fiscal year 24. Right. But we're also writing checks to the Department of Transportation Right out of the funds right. that are receiving these surpluses uh, to meet their needs. That's right. Yeah. So there. I mean, it's a it's a complicated picture. I mean, I think when all this really started to go crazy after COVID, when our budget numbers really just took off um, for a variety of different you know reasons that we've all talked about at length. We don't need to get into it again. But yeah, everything kind of picked up and and it really just changed the course. I think of of where we were headed fiscally in Mississippi. And again, just making sure that we are good stewards of that and that we kind of focus where where we can get the most impact i think is important and and also being realistic about the fact that it's not going to last forever and yeah. i think that's the big concern um, since it all took off we've talked about when it was going to return to earth and so far it hasn't <laughs> but um you know we all kind of assume it will and i think you know i saw the numbers again the numbers came out this morning and we came a, a little bit above the first month for the fiscal year 25 we were a little bit above our estimates for that that's first right month yeah so, you know, I, I get that we all get those reports. Everybody can, anybody can sign up to get them, but we get them the first, uh, the beginning of the month. And every time I see that email come across from, from my dear friend Ava at LBO, I, I get a little nervous. I'm like, oh, <laughs> downloading that attachment. You know, did we, did we meet expectations or not? Because uh, it's a lot easier to govern when you're meeting and exceeding budget expectations when you're coming up short. So yeah. um, those, those reports are getting a little more anxiety filled for me every month as I await the inevitable return to normal that everyone's talking about. And then from a, a macroeconomic perspective, there there are serious concerns that are yeah. floating around about uh, the dreaded R word, which right. would affect us here in Mississippi as well. That's right. And I mean, I, you know, as a business owner that I sell coffee, so I feel like I see we, we tend to feel those the winds moving um, and a couple of years ago, you know, when inflation really took off and was out of control, um, still not in a great spot, but when it really started, we felt that you know people buying less coffee because their loaf of bread doubled in price, or you know milk was you know, eight dollars a gallon or whatever, you know yeah. things like that. Uh, we feel that, and I can tell you, I, I feel like we're feeling it again right now that hmm. people are starting to get a little more cautious. Um, you know, the expensive cup of coffee is usually for you know people that that know how to watch their budget. One of the first things that they cut whenever things get a little tighter, and and we feel that a little bit too. So I'm I'm cautiously watching where things go the next few months and um you know hoping hoping obviously never i always root for a strong economy regardless and i hope that that's what happens but things are feeling a little less certain today than they might have been a month or two ago what uh what do you expect to happen with respect to health care the house passed a measure that would have expanded uh, medicaid under the affordable care act in mississippi the senate had another version couldn't get anything out of out of conference to put on the floor that going to be discussed again do you think yeah i think i think you know i think it'll definitely come up and i mean we all saw the the huge I mean, it was a huge bipartisan vote in the house the first uh, you know when we passed it and i think there's a lot of appetite for that and, and doing so in a way again i think this is the 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 uh, broader theme of this conversation is is looking at what we've got and spending within that and i think if there's a way um you know this next session to do what we tried to do this session what representative mcgee 
uh, my, my dear friend from, from actually we're in her district right now. Yeah. She worked very hard on that bill and I think had a really good bill, um, that, that did something really good for, um, you know, working Mississippians and it did so without costing a, a huge amount of money. Um, I think if we can get that, you know, passed, that'd be a huge win. And I think we'll, we'll see that as a priority of the house again in the next session. Minute and a half left. Uh, what about mobile sports betting? We're going to crack at that again. I hope so. Man. <laughs> I just, it kills me. You know, I was me just, too. I was just in West Virginia and I was like, this is so easy and such a no brainer and I mean, producing lots of revenue so for the state much too. revenue, so much yeah. revenue. And it's just a no brainer. And you know, it's, the politics of it for my friends on the coast, I get it. It's weird and everything, but for the rest of us, we're just looking around like, what the heck? Like, why? We've got everything but that, and it doesn't make any sense. So. All right, you know, I got to ask you the ballot initiative process. Are we ever going to get that back? I hope so. That's another one that I just I'm going to keep supporting and keep. It might be me and Representative McGee screaming in the into the void about it, but we're going to keep on doing it. So. The, those measures just die in the Senate graveyard. I know. Don't they? I know. It's really a shame because they're they're good proposals, and and I think people. People want it, and it's again a no-brainer and a win, a nonpartisan, bipartisan, across-the-board win. We got it. We just won't take it. Yep. Representative McCarty, always good to see you, sir, and thanks for coming on today. Absolutely. Thanks for having me. George. You got it. it, folks. We're stepping aside for a break. We're at the University of Southern Mississippi for Children's Advocacy Centers. Of